Hello and welcome to the Building Men podcast. My name is Dennis Meralda. Building Men is geared toward helping you become the strongest version of yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. So I did this deep dive recently and I, I started following along with the alpha hippie. His name is Angelo Cisco. And Angelo, um, one of the first episodes that I listened to, he had on a gentleman whose name is Scott Ramage. And Scott is the founder or co-founder of the Brotherhood of Fatherhood uh, podcast program, men's group. And I was initially fascinated and then like drawn in the direction of this gentleman that I have on as a guest today. There were so many similarities in my journey and Scott's journey that I reached out to Scott. I just did like a quick voice note on Instagram. I said, man, I got to connect with you because one, I believe in everything that you're doing. And two, I feel like we were, our missions were kind of separated somewhere at birth and we were just kind of going in the same direction. So Scott, welcome to the Building Men podcast, my man. I, I appreciate you being here. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, being invited. It's going to be fun. Absolutely. We have a lot to talk about, Scott. So listening to you on, on Angelo's um, podcast, I connected with Angelo and just the way that he can draw an audience in by his cadence, the volume of his voice, just it just you're you're waiting on what the next thing you're going to hear from from him and then from the guest is. And so I listened to the podcast again today. I listened to it. All one right time. On. Let's do it again today just to get some, you know, get to know you again. So you were a former educator you're a former middle school teacher for was it 13 years yes sir yeah and so um, that's where i want to start with i'm fascinated one um your journey to the decision to go into education and to you know become a middle school teacher one i believe you got to be a little fucking crazy to teach middle school right yeah. but it's so Pulled rewarding yeah <laughs> absolutely so rewarding once you're in that realm right so one how did you kind of get into the idea that you wanted to be a middle school teacher and then how did you you know segue out of that into what you're doing currently well that's a really great question which makes me really think uh back on just our my journey you know i was not i grew up in a a family with a dad who started and ran his own business from very young we my parents were business owners and kind of always working that, that I guess you say grind. Um, and so when I was a junior in high school, everybody started asking me what I was going to do. And I'm like, I have no idea. I don't, I don't even care. Like I'm just enjoying my time. I had all sorts of side gigs. I was doing all sorts of jobs and I never put thought to it. So uh, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, very directed, knew exactly what she wanted to do. And so my decision to become an educator initially was literally following her, going to a college close to her that I could afford and that I could get into because I care less about school when I was in it. And so um, I got in it and wasn't too intrigued. Wasn't I wasn't like following rules and steps and processes for me. I was just going to do the opposite thing. I was just, it's just kind of how I, how I functioned. And so I didn't fall into the right, um, right realm inside of that uh, institution and ended up with a degree in psychology, which I was fascinated in. So I got into uh, psychology. And when I did that, of course, my, my grades went through the roof and I was excelling. And I immediately went into, the, um, out of college, I became a manager for a group treatment home for youth. And that was, dude, talk about insane, you know, kids that were, this is basically their step before going to juvenile prison. They were um, literally rapists, attempted murder type, 10, 11, 12 year old kids. And here I am right out of college managing this program for them. And um, that eventually led me back to education because I was like, I just love working with kids. And I started kind of doing some stuff in the classroom and it led me back to education. I went and got my master's degree uh, in education and stepped into it and just had a phenomenal experience the first five, six years of teaching. And when you said that, I mean, that blew my mind. One, your background with psychology. So in New Jersey, where I got my degree um, in the, uh, the school, I went to New Jersey, you have to have a dual major. And so the major that I selected was sociology. So I graduated with a degree in elementary education. I was certified to teach kindergarten through eighth grade, but I had a dual major in sociology. So I was always fascinated with the group dynamics. And Part of my internship, my um, junior year, I had to do a practicum for teaching and also a practicum for sociology. I was actually placed in a group home and those kids, I was like, I drove a, a van. I drove the kids to and from this place. It was an after school program. They were there from four until 10 every night, but they were there because the courts 
or because of Division of Youth and Family Services, like we call the DIFUS in New Jersey, um, because they were there, there was some kind of an issue that went on at home. It was sexual abuse, physical abuse. A couple of the kids, they one kid tried to kill his old man because it was a sexual abuse situation. So just the fact that we had that similar background that I had no That's idea until you just said that, it's really yeah. wild. So yeah. your background in psychology, obviously, going in as a middle school educator, so much of what you needed to do it wasn't about the curriculum you were teaching. It was getting into the heads of those adolescent kids that were in front of you. And that's where I, that's where I excelled. At that time, it was the year 2000. Um, I, was, I, uh, I was teaching. I was, the curriculum wasn't fully developed. It's like, here's the subject. And so I got to be super creative, but mostly I got to build this around what kids were interested in figuring out ways to connect with them really wholeheartedly connect with them. So I did, I had incredible success and this, you know, I am going to puff my chest up. I was really good at connecting with the really high achievers because I would give them just really high level tasks, just like go learn this and then teach us. And, you know, did some real creative things, but I also really connected with the high flyers, the, the um, kids that were on the spectrum and ones that were always getting in trouble and, and had immediate success in that. And I would connect with their parents, connect with them. It was so authentic. It was so fun because I wasn't being created. This machine and where I was teaching at wasn't telling me, do this on this day, do this on this day, do this on this day. I was able to create and mold that around the interest and the pace of the students. And we, we um, got incredible results because they were all so invested. And, um, and I think that comes from my background in psychology and then working in the group home. I mean, I had days where kids would, I had a kid with a fresh bucket of, you know, he was mopping the floors and he decided to mop my face, you know, and here I have these like chemicals in my eyes and you can't do anything. So I've kind of been through the fire on how to handle some, some um, individuals, youth that had some really huge issues. So stepping in classroom was like a piece of cake. And, um, and so I was able to thrive for like five years just absolutely thrive. I was actually teaching in a sixth grade that was still all inclusive. So I taught every single subject except for music. Thank goodness I wasn't teaching. <laughs> <laughs> but to have that autonomy as a teacher, um, one, I mean, give credit to the school where you were working, where you you had that ability to kind of understand, okay, maybe there was a, you know, a guide, a curricular guide of where they needed to get to, but it wasn't this prescribed on week three, you needed to be addressing this on week five, this where it almost became robots that you would, you know, turn the, you know, the little wind up thing, and they were all marching in the same direction, which is what I found education started to become, especially after almost 20 years in my experience. Yeah, I mean, that's the reason I left. I mean, it, it, it there was several reasons. One, I, I was very entrepreneurial minded and education, I was able to create so much in those early years that I didn't need to really um, create outside of, outside of that element. But I was, I was taking kids to the skate park every day, loading my cart up. I was at, as an avid skateboarder, I was skateboarding with them. I was teaching them all these other things. I was, I was very involved. And then as soon as I kind of the, um, as the, as the, the walls started closing in the, the we switched, got a new principal, the walls started to close in and my, my autonomy and my ability to really just play to the students strengths and interests when, as that went away, I started to really start to like, I need something more. Like there's no room for growth. Like there's no personal development going on here. And I didn't really understand what that meant. And there's no, like, I don't want to be a principal for me. I did not want to be an admin but there was no way up. It's like, I'm doing the same thing and the walls are closing in more and more and more and more every, every day. And my impact on students is becoming less and less and less and less. Right. And then that's when I got, I stepped back into those entrepreneurial roles and started a, a successful bike shop at that time. And it really kind of just changed how I started uh, interacting in the school environment. So can you pick out a couple moments in your own experience um, that might have led you down the path to want to help students that might've been struggling in a specific way? Dude, I had horrible experiences at school. Um, so I, I went to the same school that I first started teaching in when I, when I got my degree, um, I swore I'd never go back to that town. And here I am going back to the school, I, country school I went to at that same school. I was really bullied. I was very independent. I had my own, I was very conscientious of how I looked. I had my own style. I loved my own style. I would dress that way, but I'd take a lot of grief for it. Yeah. 
And then I was also, uh, I've always been smaller. So I was smaller. So it's an easy target. And um, as I explained on the Alpha Hippie podcast, there was just a moment in school where I was done with it and, and um, just kicked a kid in the nuts so hard and then punched him when he was down, which was awesome. And um, that was a, that was a defining moment for me in my education. Then there's these stories throughout middle school, middle school was rough. And then in high school, I just didn't care. I just got good grades. I stayed out of the way of the teachers. I kind of just tried to disappear and just have fun with my friends. But um, just, I did not fit the teacher's role the teacher's model of what my, I should be doing. I was a skateboarder. Uh, I had an experience where I was doing better at skateboarding than, than wrestling. I was undefeated in wrestling and I quit wrestling because I wanted to go skate. And my te- I was a teacher at the time. And I, I was like, now that guy would have been fired the next day. I mean, he called me pussy. He was all over me on like, you know, what, how I was acting in school and the decisions I was making. It was just utter abuse. Now I own that. I, cause I took it to heart. And I, all these experiences though, what I learned is that I had a few teachers who just sincerely cared about the person I was and found something I was interested in. And I thrived in those situations. And that formed me into like, Hey, look, I don't want to be the teacher that knows everything. I don't want to be the teacher that is going to just go with the flow, which is very common. Um, I'm going to be an innovator and I'm going to be that teacher I needed when I was in middle school. And, um, and, and I think that just wholeheartedly drove me for those first few years it drove me in my college, in my master's degree, um, you, know, you know, I was, I just was fully, fully devoted to it because I believed that education needed people like me and that I could make a difference. And Scott, you mentioned the, that wrestling coach you had, was that a high school wrestling coach? He was actually a middle school, middle wrestling, school wrestling coach. coach. Yep. So it, it hits home with me one as a um, high school athlete. So I played baseball and basketball in high school and I had a basketball coach who I, I started varsity my sophomore year. I'm a big guy, I'm 6'4", 220. Uh, so I was, you know, I played like power forward, never looked terribly successful in basketball, um, but I was a big guy, I was a big body. And I remember being shamed on, in, on the middle of the court, basically, I missed a layup or, you know, I didn't box out my man and we would get big crowds when I was in high school. And I still remember him like grabbing me by my shirt, Meralda, what the fuck you, fu-? and just, just shaming me publicly. And I remember thinking every, I, all I wanted to do was not make a mistake. So I tried to like almost be smaller when I was this big dude on the basketball court. Conversely, I had a coach in baseball and that was my sport. And I wound up playing in college after that was everything that I did, even if there was a mistake, it was an opportunity for me to learn something that I did that maybe I can correct to become better. So I never looked at mistakes or I never m- looked at things that way anymore. So the, the impact that a coach especially can have on a young man going through school, where when they're calling you a fucking pussy, especially in front of your, your peers, mm-hmm. that does some, some deep damage. So you took that and you're like, you know what, I'm never going to do this shit when I am in front of a class of my own one day. Right. Well, and, and in high school, I played soccer. I wasn't a star. I worked really hard to be on varsity. I mean, I had to work hard. And I, I remember um, the athletic trainer had his bum ankle and he's like, meet me in the football locker room. And so it was after school and I went to the football locker room and buddy and I went to the football locker room. We were standing there and the football coach walked up and just started screaming at us. And we're like, hey, we're meeting the trainer. He literally took me by my shirt and push me against the wall and just laid into me. You're here to destroy my locker room and just went into me. I left. Um, and, uh, and I remember talking to the trainer. I'm like, Hey, I, sorry, I didn't show up this, this coach, you know, that was the first time I had actually had a teacher stand up for, or a staff member stand up for me. And that was so incredibly profound because the next day that football coach who was a legend, um, I, he, he came up and apologized to me, you know, and it was like, whoa, this guy who's infallible in the eyes of the, our town, you know, they're sending him on trips every year. They're, they sent him to the Super Bowl on a cruise. I mean, they were, they treated him like a God. He came to me and he apologized because of the impact of one person. And I remember that. And I remember how it helped me also realize that I don't have to be a, uh, um, a victim to uh, authority figures. <laughs> and, and because I would, I, I had learned not to be a victim to my peers. I, I, I shared that story now. They podcast. 
I shared a little bit here. I, I learned I did not have to be a victim to my peers, but I hadn't figured that out with authority figures yet. I had an amazing relationship with my father and my mother, never had to kind of deal with that. But in that circumstance, I was like, wait a minute, I don't need to be a victim. That was a real pivotal moment. And then I realized that people within a building can make a difference. And so um, that was just another opportunity for me to be like, this is how I want to be. I want to be that voice. I want to be that person that lifts people up and not break them down. And it is amazing the power that one person can have on the life of not only you as a student, but think of the ripple effect that made on you showing up for other people, knowing that there was that one person who went out on a limb and challenged the fucking mighty whoever he was. Now think about it. I mean, I'm thinking if there was a situation where a coach grabbed a kid and slammed up against the wall, they wouldn't work again. A career would be I mean, that would be it. But in our generation, like I had coaches put their hands on me. Oh yeah. And coaches would say stuff in front of me that I could never imagine, or even tolerating my own children dealing with someone like that. So what what was the moment? Can you can you pick out that moment where you're like, you know what? Not only am I okay with you know standing up and you know being able to speak what is in my heart to my peers, but also people that I perceive to be in a higher position, like a superiority type position, was there a moment where you're like, all right, now I feel confidence that I'm not going to take this shit anymore? You know, I don't know. Um, it took me years and years and years to refine it to a place where it was actually super effective. So I became pretty, uh, pretty obviously against those forces. Like when something would come up against me, I was, I was not a uh, real strategic about it. I remember training in high school. I, I was running every day and I was in incredible shape. And my buddy and I, we, we were out on a super hot summer day. We took our shirts off. We were training to make sure that we were the top, top ready for the soccer team. We were ready to roll. We we're going to be starters. We're going to be, you know, uh, and um, we were running across a, a crosswalk in our, in our very small town. It was really uh, low income and um, a pickup truck full of at that point, I guess you just say rednecks were drinking. They almost ran over us and they started screaming and yelling at us. And I was, I, I had at some point in my life decided I'm not taking it from anybody. And so I said something or made some gesture. I don't actually don't remember, but I was running. And I remember within a second, my buddy's like, uh, watch out. And the next thing I know, I'm on the ground being just getting the living shit kicked out of me. And, um, the guy had come up, he had a, he had a broken arm. So he had a cast on his arm and he hit me from behind and knocked me out. And then the other guys just came and just pummeled me. So I walked into the local restaurant and I was blood everywhere. I mean, skin was gone. My face was completely split open. Um, and, and I just, it's like, almost like I didn't learn because I, instead of going into situations where adversity is there, instead of treating it, being the right having the right response, I was really just like fighting it. Right. And even after that, even after getting the crap beat out of me by strangers, um, I still didn't really learn. And I think I kind of even, you know, what really what happened was when the day I quit education was the first time I actually did it right. And that was, you know, well into my thirties, maybe yeah, thirties. And there are these responses to fear that, I mean, one fear manifests itself in our bodies in so many different ways. And there's that flight response where you retreat. There's the fight where you go at the, whatever the, the, the cause of the stress is, the freeze response. And then they're calling it like the flock or fawn response, where it's almost like you become a chameleon and you just kind of assimilate. Well, you change your, your viewpoint just so you don't fear that pushback in any way. And not saying that there's one way that's better than another way, because like the fight response can be really good in situations, but in other situations, you can wind up with your ass beat on the floor, or whatever. Yeah. So based on that situation, how have you, how has it helped you deal with conflict, even in your, in your professional life now, because you took, maybe you were all the way on one side and I, I went through a similar journey, Scott, all the way through, you know, understanding so long in my life. I was bullied when I was in sixth grade. I got my ass kicked by kids that were two years older than me, chased home from the bus stop, beaten up a couple times. But for me, I never told anyone about it. In my, in my upbringing, it was you, you need to man up. I needed to go fight that kid, you know, based on, you know, what I felt that my, my, especially my old man wanted me to do. And I was scared. So there was a long time in my life 
that I was like, you know what, let me just kind of go along with the crowd and not make waves because I don't want to live mm. in that fear anymore. And it took me a long time in my life till finally I was like, you know what, I'm never going to let someone make me feel a certain way. I'm going to keep pushing back against it. So there's that pendulum that swung for me back and forth. For you, how did you do it in that that sense? You just mentioned the first time you did it appropriately was when you left education. It was. I love it. it. And, and quite honestly, you know, I was fed up, we, we can get into that story, but I was fed up with the system. I was fed up. I'd created a program that was wildly successful and I was getting kickback from the superintendent because parents were complaining because it wasn't fair that their kid couldn't be a part of a higher level leadership experience. And, and for me, I'm like, you know, <laughs> like entitlement is not the way I rolled at that point. But um, even after that, I've just, attempt, I've done things so wrong. Like I, any conflict that came would stir me up. And my, um, my response, I, I basically amygdala hijack. I couldn't think, and it was all just instinct and piss and vinegar and, and saying things. In, in that situation, as, as leaving education, I was in the midst of a lot of personal development, a lot of personal growth. And I'm like, look, I'm not gonna be involved in a place where mediocrity, and entitlement are the name of the game. I, I, I am going to I am going to put myself in places where growth mindset is is enabled, where it is in, in you know embraced, and this is not it. And for that, I am leaving this. I am never coming back. And I was kind of like a shame on you for being the leader of the school and letting this happen. And um, I'm really lucky he didn't just say get out of this building now and never come back but I know they needed me and I had a lot of parents on my side. So, you know, um, I had that, but e so even up until two years ago, I would get amygdala hijack where I just had zero. I would get wound up, something hit me and I would just be off, off. And I would just dig into that person, you know, an airline attendant telling me something I didn't want to hear or, or someone double billing me on something. I would just go into like, just attack. And, um, I realized that that was hindering my ability to succeed in things. It was 100% like just absolutely slowing me down. And so that's when I really dove into, um, I'd always fought stoicism, not because like, it just seems so, uh, I can't think of the word. It seems so studious. It seems, it seemed too smart for me. And then, um, so I, I'm like, I have to be able to handle situations better and then I really dug into it. And I learned that like all those, op all those experiences can be actually opportunities for growth or, or to improve my circumstances are they are. So as soon as I switched that mindset, I have a picture of uh, Marcus Aurelius behind me and the book, The Obstacles Away, because they were so life-changing in the way that I handle things. And, um, and so I've been able to completely switch and Here's the thing is I've always been oppositional because I, I there was there's a lot of injustice and things that I didn't agree with. But until I embrace that, I'm able to take that opposition opposition and use it as a tool for me. And when that happened, I had a business on my hands that's been wildly successful. I have been able to speak a lot stronger and connect a lot better with people. And I'm just way more at peace. So I had this long journey, but it, it wasn't until like 45 years old that I figured it out. And I, I really truly feel like I am on the path of figuring it out. I'm, I'm not there, but I'm so much farther now. And I think my journey started in my 43rd year. I'm 44 now, but it started in that 43rd year. And I believe that I've learned more in the last 12 months of my life than I did the previous 43 years. And the Stoics have taught us a couple things. I mean, one being able to, instead of that initial, you know, you know, ready, fire, aim, to be able to kind of think into situations. Before we started the podcast today, I shared with you that I was in a conversation with someone who his viewpoints were so vehemently opposed to what I believe a man should be. And I'm sitting there like really thinking through, do I want to invite this man into building men? Do I want to have him on as a guest and interview him and and really, you know, go down this path of of entitlement with men are entitled to, you know, certain things where 
what I believe is not that I believe that you need to be the best version of you first and then what you need to do good by other people. And that's that's part of being a man. And so I, I went through this like stoic journey in my my head during this conversation is do I want to light in light up this guy right now? Do I want to lay into him? Do I want to have him on as a guest and then really challenge? Finally, I'm like, you know what I have a with a conversation with my girlfriend, I, ha I have a con I have a duty to the people that are listening to try to present things in a way that I believe in. So I can't endorse something that is opposed to my own train of thought. And um, think about Marcus Aurelius. I mean, he was in this leadership position. And still the meditations is one of my favorite books of all time. I mean, just the way that he communicates. It's it's really next level shit. And how many years ago was that? It's it's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, there's a few things that I really believe strongly in is usually um, it's the it's make the hard right decision. Usually the right decisions are always a lot more resistance. There's a lot more resistance. They're, they're harder to do. It's harder to stand up for something you believe than to just be that chameleon you were talking about earlier. Yeah. It's harder to um, say something knowing that you're going to get fire back in the group. Well, uh, just last week I said, I, made a post that says shit happens. Your response is your responsibility. And I'm like, the whole thing was, Hey, life sucks at times. It's going to happen to you, but how you respond is what matters. And I got this, <laughs> you probably saw it. I got this yeah. message. This guy's like, this is so negative. How dare you use this language? And I'm like, Hey, look, and, and it was that moment. I'm like, I, I went back to that. I just erased it. And I sent him a nasty message. And, um, and so I erased the message and then I erased my erase because I'm like, no, I need to stand on what I believe. Hey, look, I don't, I don't swear that often. Like in my own opinion, I, I, I have an ability to use other adjectives. So for me, it's, it's a, it's a level of challenging my brain. Like, because like when I'm really mad, it's really easy to let an F-bomb or two right. drop. It's, I mean, it's just, it's an initial response. So I was like, Hey, look, like, it's not the language I use all the time, but I feel really strongly about this. And the fact that you are having a problem with this means you just don't get it. And it's cool because I realized that by standing up to the belief, because I believe so wholeheartedly, the way that we respond to things is our responsibility. It has nothing to do with anybody else. It's right here on me. Um, and and uh, I needed to stand, you know, plant my flag in the ground and be like, no. This is, this is what I believe. I don't care what you say. If you don't like it, like leave. And there's a lot of, a, a lot of um, freedom in that and yes. not caring what he thinks and whether he stays in my group or not. I mean, there's 3,500 other men who um, I'd love to, I, here's the thing. I have 3,500 men in my Facebook group. I would love to, for it to be 500 because I pissed the other 3,000 off because they don't believe in what I believe. That's 100% fine with me, like, right? I mean, and so I had to come to this uh, place where I don't need to seek the approval of everyone else. And that's been another piece of freedom for me where I'm like, I don't care what they think. Like, I'm going to succeed because I believe in what I believe in. And I'm going to stake my, my flag in the ground and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live and die by that. And it's so freeing to come to that realization. It, and I'm in the same way. It took me a long time to get to that spot. But once you're there, it's, it's a very freeing feeling not really worrying about other people's opinions. I know for me, even with Building Men, the journey that I've been on, a lot of it was I wasn't really able to speak what I believed in because of my affiliations with certain school districts, working as a coach and a consultant. And mm -hmm. I know any day I can get a call being like, listen, we don't want you in our school because we heard you on your podcast talking about how you believe education is failing kids right now, which I totally believe in. But for yes. such a long time, I was afraid to say that. Finally, I was like, you know what, I'm going to put it out there. And if people don't agree with it, and it, it impacts me in that way, so be it, at least I'm able to look at myself in the mirror and say, I'm doing that for that specific reason. Yeah, I mean, I, I have been, um, I still have family that's in, in education, and I keep my kids in public education, even though there's some things that just like drive me over the edge. And, and it's hard. But for me, I, I really do believe the path of resistance is usually the best path for growing. And I want to raise future adults, I don't want to raise kids. And so I know that by pushing them into this place of apathy, <laughs> into this place that doesn't support um, real freedom, it doesn't support really who we're supposed to be. It's just kind of a cog in the machine. Here, I want you to be a cog in the machine. 
go to school, learn to, to regurgitate the stuff that we want you to regurgitate, go to college because college is the next level. We will indoctrinate you in whatever we want to indoctrinate you. And then you go into a career and you'll be safe and perfect for the rest of your life, which is a bunch of bullshit. It is so wrong. Now, is there people who, if you want to be a doctor or a teacher, if you are adamant, if that is your life vision, then you got to go through those steps. You know, please don't be a doctor and not go to med school. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't work <laughs> but, on Right. I, I just don't believe in, in the machine. And here's something that I made a realization on the other day. And I don't know if this will rub you wrong as past administrator, but the school machine right now is designed to have teachers become robots. They are there to deliver curriculum in the way that they're told to deliver curriculum. If you change any of it, you are stepping outside your bounds. I remember hours and hours and hours and hours of staff meetings and, and development days. They were never, ever based on how you become a better person and how you connect with your students better. Never. It was all about curriculum and how to do what we want you to do. And in my opinion, it was, it's by design. They do not want teachers thinking for themselves because then they become me. <laughs> and then they realize how broken the system is. It's such a system. Uh, in, I'm speaking in generalization. I hope I don't get you in trouble. It's such no, a listen, it's, it's all out. Yeah. I need to say whatever you want to say. Okay. Yes. It is a system designed to build people, apathetic adults who rely on a paycheck, a consistent paycheck, and want to just walk through the system and, um, and to make kids exactly what we want them to be. So they fit into this big machine. And um, I don't think everybody thinks of it that way, but they're part of it. So they don't see it. But I also, um, I just, I feel so strongly about it, but I also feel like my kids need to go through it so I can talk them through it and they see it. And, and like, if they want to go to college, I'm going to fully support them. If they want to build a business. I want to fully support yep. them. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have their back because like I said, I'm not here to create a robot. I'm not here to raise a kid, which we have tons of adult kids right now. That's a problem in our, in our country. Hey, by the way, unemployment is going to pay you more than working. And it's like, ooh, I can be a kid and stay at home and make more than I would working. And what do we have ourselves right now? We have a massive work. We, have, we don't have a workforce. There's no workforce right now because they're getting paid more to work at home. I, I'm going off on a tangent here. My dad knows uh, an owner of a, of a lumber mill and he's extremely successful. Well, right now, lumber prices are through the roof, right? And he's like, so my dad went and got some lumber from him, had some, they fresh cut it. They, they do it per order. And my dad's like, hey, um, you know, how are things going? He's like, I, I, I sell what I sell for uh, two bucks. The supply store now is selling for over 50 for the exact same thing. He goes, but the problem right now is I can now skyrocket. I have, have to skyrocket my prices because I can only run a half day shift because everybody is at home because they're making more on unemployment than they make with me. He said, they all love work. They all have come to me and said, we love working for you. As soon as our checks from unemployment are lower than what we make for you, we'll come back. Wow. And I'm like going, this is the machine that I hate so yeah. much. And um, I will do anything to keep my kids out of that machine. And I just, I think, I, you know, I, I, I realized this, the kind of the raunchiness I was sitting in and, um, and, and that's kind of what led me on this path and where I'm at today. I, I, I wouldn't take it back for a moment. And I perpetuated that whole thing that was going on as an administrator, I would go in and observe classes. I would observe teachers and administrators had the idea of like, listen, this teacher is maybe substandard. We need you to put the pressure on this teacher to turn up the heat because we need to start a paper trail to get rid of them. Those conversations absolutely happen behind the scenes in every single school district where I work. Yeah. The other thing is that there was a, it was like a checklist of to be a good teacher. You needed within the first five minutes to address the lesson objective. You needed to circulate around the room a certain number of times. The standards on your lesson plan needed to match up in this specific order. It was, and it was this way where they were robots. And anybody who thought a little bit outside or did something that maybe didn't align with Charlotte Danielson, who was this guru in education or McCrell or Strong, the people that created the observation instruments, then it became like that teacher was a wild card and we needed to, again, turn up the heat to get rid of them in some way. So it did, it, and think about it, we were 
you know, creating students because that's the teachers that were in front of them because they were scared for their their own jobs. You know, they weren't yeah. allowed to think outside of that box. And yeah. I'm in the same spot. I left a six figure job with I basically I needed to coast along for another 12 years to get this pension that I could have been sitting pretty. But it was I couldn't do it anymore, Scott. I couldn't do it. So the fact that we kind of have that similar journey as well, um, I felt the same way. And Did I. You get I did you get massive pressure? I remember the, the last day I taught, I had multiple people come up to me, but I had one guy come up to me. He was a career educator and um, he really fought with me because he, he wanted to be the top dog. And, you know, my program was going ballistic and it was hard to get into it. And kids were knocking the doors down and became a popularity contest. And he came up to me the last day and he's having really nice conversations with me. He goes, you know, you're just stupid. I'm like, why is that? He goes, you're leaving an amazing job and you're never going to make it. And I was like, dude, in the last six months, I've tripled my income outside of teaching while I'm teaching. And you're telling me I'm crazy. And I'm just like, Hey, have a good year yeah. <laughs> later. But that was the, that was the message over and over and over my, my um, confidence, my success drove other teachers crazy so did you get that narrative when you left like you're crazy you're leaving a perfect job i want to say there there wasn't one person at the time in my life that said you're you're doing this for the right reasons or you're making a good decision i got out of there and um for a year i was doing a lot i, I was busy i was i was working with school districts i was training i was coaching i was consulting i was speaking at larger conferences doing professional development but then with covid it's like everything shut down and so right. now i bet on myself and it was like, okay, I went through this period where what's going on? Plus, I'm going through a divorce at that time. And my ex was carrying the benefits. And now I'm like, whoa, you blew it, dude. Like there were, I had a lot of come to Jesus moments where I'm like, I can't believe that I left. And I scrambled trying to get back into education at that time. And every door was closed because I left after 20 years, 14 as or 15 as an administrator. And now I'm trying to get back in after a year. It looked really, really bad on my resume. Right. And But at that moment, I was like, you know what? I did this for a reason. I need to continue to push my chips in and gamble on myself because it's about that purpose. It's not a, the security. I need to be able to gamble on me. So that's what it ultimately came. I believe in what I'm doing and I'm going to keep going full force forward in that direction. Right. Yeah. It's scary. It's scary. So it's really scary. I I'm so interested. I mean, I definitely want to move towards the brotherhood of fatherhood idea and how that came to be. But before I do, obviously you mentioned your, you know, you have a good relationship with your parents and your father in particular. And he was, he was a grinder. And I can connect in that way as well. My father, um, he started his own business when he was maybe 21 years old. Um, he was a blue collar worker, a painter. He still does that. You know, he's 69 years old and he still works, you know, three or four days a week. I think a lot of his identity was based on that. I'm, I'm going to work. I'm going to provide for my family. So I'm curious in what lessons about masculinity did you learn from your father growing up? Oh man, that's, that's an awesome question. He was, he was, um, I, I learned that we can be self-sufficient. I learned that the true uh, role of a masculine man is having your values in order and following them. I learned that a, the true role of a man is serving your wife. Like, you know, we talk about like ma male and female roles in the family. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about like, this is the person you chose to be with. And he was just through the ups and downs and all the craziness he was he would come home from long hours of work and he would put everything aside and pay attention to my mom and my brother or my sister and I and so he valued those things so much that he would put everything aside and so no matter how hard he worked he was incredibly attentive and incredibly involved. When I was a skateboarder in, in middle school, he couldn't figure out how to quite connect because I was wanting to go skate all the time. So we spent a year building a half pipe. I was the cool kid with the half pipe in my backyard. And then be, before we knew it, we lived in the country. Our house was just always had youth over. He, he hated that I skated, but he embraced it because he realized that that was the path to helping um, guide me and, and teach me even in these moments when I wasn't real moldable. And so like for him, it was, is like, 
you know, have your beliefs, stand firm in them. That's what a true man does is he has a strong belief and he stands firm in them and he leads his family. When I say lead your family, I don't mean like, as like, tell your wife what to do or tell your kids to do. lead them into their own growth. I feel that that's part of masculinity. We're designed to excel. We're designed to compete. We're designed to always try and be better internally. We're designed to survive. I mean, if you go back and back and back, we're designed to survive. If you didn't kill for your family, you didn't feed your family, you all died. <laughs> you know, yep. if you died while you were out pursuing the hunt, your your family would go starve. Um, and so I feel that like, we have this innate peace in us and they let me be just an all out boy. They let me run in the woods and shoot BB guns. We'd shoot BB guns at each other, my friends and I, and it was crazy dangerous and I could have lost an eye, but I learned so many things through that. And, you know, he, he just, he's, he's, he's authentic, he's vulnerable, but he also has his beliefs and sticks with them. So you talk a lot about this value ladder that you have in your life, and that kind of drives you how you show up in every relationship, how you are as a man. So tell us a little bit about what that means. What is your value ladder? So uh, ladder, you know, there's the top rung things. You could talk, call it as pyramid. You could call it whatever you want. But I have a, a, a things that are important to me. And first is my faith. And yes, that's people don't understand that that's before my wife and my kids, but that's okay. That's for me. So like in everything I do every day, the first thing I do is address those things that are in my value ladder. So I've got faith. Then I have my wife and this, this bucks a lot of men, but I, I just like, look, you, you've been through a divorce. You, you had probably a long period of moving apart from each other. And I think that's a, you know, I think that's avoidable if we have the right things in place. Now there are two players. So, right. you know, we can do our role, but for me, my wife becomes before my kids because I chose her before I had kids. And so I will do and act in everything to make sure that things happen in those orders. My kids are next. And then become, think, comes things like fitness and finances and, you know, all the other things. Um, but so it's my decision. I believe that if you have a business or your personal or your family, you should have values and every single decision you make is based on those values. Right now, I want a new truck. I haven't had a truck. My kid crashed my car. I bought him another car because I'm, we just, he's so moving around. I'm like, it's, it's, you know, it's not freedom to be driving him everywhere. So this was my freedom. I want a new truck, but I'm like, I'm going to buy it with cash. This is like, I want, I saw one yesterday, incredible price, exactly what I sold my, my favorite truck of all time, almost exactly. And I'm like, I just need to buy it but my values came into play. Okay. Having cash for that and paying with cash is a value that I've decided to put in place. And so that drove the decision. It doesn't matter how good of a deal it is. It doesn't matter. It's not, does not lie within my values. So when you have your values in order and they're written down and they're absolute and you speak them over and over again, and everyone around you knows what they are, you will make massive gains in your life. So that's my value ladder. It's just making sure that everything has an order. And then I make decisions based on that order. And I've heard you talk before about you had this moment. So you you were an entrepreneur. You had a business. It was a, a bike shop. So you were working before teaching. Then you were working an eight hour day teaching, and then you were working at night in the shop as well. Yep. So you had this moment that you talked about. And I'll let you bring up this moment where you kind of came home, and it was this like you know a punch in the stomach where you realize like, wow, where is my value ladder out of whack right now, and what I need to be aligned to. And that's why I'm so adamant about this. I didn't have a value ladder. I was raised with watching my dad have one, but I hadn't really kind of downloaded it and fully experienced it yet. So I was working. I felt like working was the way I was supporting for my family because I was making money. But in that whole journey, I was working so many hours. And then when I wasn't working, I was serving my clients through going on bike rides with them, doing big adventures all over the state, you know, downhill bike racing and, you know, big treks out in the country. And like I wasn't with my family at all, all in the name of being a better uh, provider. So my value ladder was so screwed up. And I've interviewed a lot of men. And um, it's one, there's a few things that, that happen in order when these men that are successful in life that they've been through. One is they have a big aha moment where they realize, whoa, I am not in a, something I'm doing is wrong. And they yep. actually decide to make a change. My big aha moment was coming home at night. I'd said no to my family to so many things. We didn't vacation. 
I always had a rep come in on Halloween. So we'd spend Halloween at the shop. <clears throat> you know, it was just stupid stuff I was doing. Came home, house was dark. I hadn't been home since 4.30 a.m. I come home, the house is dark. My wife's asleep, my boys are asleep. My boys are young and I'm like, whoa. I'm like missing life. So that was the big aha moment for me. The other one was then I went through this. We actually shut that business down because I made a decision. I wasn't going to let it rule my life anymore, even though it probably would have been a better decision to keep it and get out of teaching right. um, because I took a massive uh, debt load by closing it down. But I did it because I told my wife, we got to get rid of this because I need to be a dad and a husband. And um, But the problem is, is I didn't have my identity in place. My identity was... Uh, and I'm very adamant about this. I was a bike shop owner. I was a teacher. I had my identity wrapped up in what I was doing, but not really who I was and who I was. I'm a father. I'm a, I'm a, a, a supporter of my wife. I'm a, my wife's best friend. I'm a guy that loves doing outdoor things. I have a bigger purpose than my work. It took me two years of like deep tunnel vision depression to get to figure out that even though I shut that thing down, basically what I did is I chopped my balls off. I got rid of, I had no purpose anymore. And so I'm really, these guys that I interview, they're like me, they've had this big aha moment. And then they realize, they come to the, the conclusion that their identity is all screwed up. They've had their identity and how much money they have or the truck that they drive, I've done that too, or the, the, the hobby they're involved in. That's why so many men are so focused on the sports or so focused on their career because they've misaligned their identity and they don't know how else to act. And so once I had those two things figured out and then I kind of got everything else in my own thought process into control, everything started to click. Business, I had a business grow out of nothing and become, you know, almost an overnight success and a brotherhood of fatherhood came to fruition and I started connecting with incredible men. So that's, those things are just so near and dear to me because I see young guys dealing with this all the time. And I'm like, I want to help them not go through the pain, financial, marital, fatherhood, all those sufferings that I went through. You know, if I can reduce that, in, that, uh, that, that experience for men and get them closer to their identity earlier on, I'm super happy. Absolutely. And think about this to your point, you could interview, you know, a thousand men and you ask them to tell, say, tell me something about your, yourself. I want to say a, a vast majority of them would start with what they do. They would start with what their profession is because that's so many men we're tied to what we do, not who we are internally. So I, I can, I can tell you the exact date where I had that moment. It was, it was April 21st of 2020 where I, I had that date where I was like, I looked at myself and said, I am not okay with this right now. Right. I had, and the, there's these paths that converge in the woods, diverge in the woods. And I needed to take the path of more resistance moving forward. But that's a thing that, you know, when you find it, even though people are telling you it's not the right decision, once you believe it yourself, it all kind of, you know, it starts to work out, even though it's rough. And like you mentioned, it's more important to go through that rough path. It's more important to go through the rough shit because you learn so much about yourself and what you're capable of doing throughout that journey. You do. And I, one thing I, I talk about this um, com comfort <laughs> continuum the further away you are from comfort, the more success you're going to have. There's just no way around it. If you find yourself comfortable in a place, you have become stagnant. And being stagnant is not, uh, it's the opposite of growth. So when I started to really embrace discomfort, when I started to be okay with physical discomfort, um, financial discomfort, like learning, you know, uh, being vulnerable, like we're, we're all vulnerable, but expressing my vulnerabilities, sharing those vulnerabilities. When I got stepped into that discomfort is when things started to click. Yep. And starting the brotherhood of fatherhood, um, you know, group that tribe together, tell us a little bit about how one, you made the decision to do that. And then tell us about what it is a little bit about what that, that group does and what they're about. So I'd moved to Texas uh, six years ago and I, I came from a small town the only time I wasn't in that small town is when I was off at college or grad school. And so I had always kind of had this default tribe and, um, and I moved to Texas and just figured I was just going to have people to be with and enjoy. But then I realized that that was all based on work and that was not how I wanted to have a tribe. And so I was incredibly frustrated. I started listening to all these men, you know, um, 
Ryan Mickler was really, really a strong voice in my head. And I thought about following, you know, going, getting involved in his things and fo following, but I was, have never been a follower. And so I was incredibly frustrated. I had no tribe of men. I was really disenlightened by, disheartened by the, the guys that I had been around. Um, no, no offense to them. They just weren't in a growth period in their life. And I, I had this internal angst and it was just crazy. It was crazy. I was so frustrated. And I made really great friends with Josh Price, the co-founder. And I remember texting him one time from an idea I got from another men's group that I haven't mentioned, but I'm like, Hey, this is something they do. Should we do this together? And then that became like, look, I don't want to follow people. Like I, I, I want to lead. Like there's just this, this internal thing inside of me always. And I'm like, Hey, let's create something. And then we were playing around with names and he just shot that name to me one day. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Because I'm, I'm very, very adamant about men being better fathers, which I believe starts with men being better, um, better spouses, better boyfriends, better, whatever. I, I believe wholeheartedly that to be an awesome father, we have to have our stuff together. Um, and so I was kind of following this manliness stuff, this uh, masculinity stuff. I was whole lockstep into it, but I didn't want to follow. So we, we created the brotherhood of fatherhood without really a vision of what that was going to be. But we realized that the, um, I mean, within two weeks of kind of opening the group up, there was two, 2000 men in there. And we realized that there are men out there looking for a tribe. And, and so we created it. And um, the podcast was born out of that. Actually, our business was actually born out of a need that we had doing our podcast. And then um, we've just kind of cultivated this, this brotherhood as it is. And I uh, try to just relay information that I think will help men grow. And we try to challenge them. And um, this happened, started all during COVID, of course, right at the beginning of COVID, which um, either seemed to break people or make people. And yeah. we let it make us. And so... Um, one of our big, big visions is having men, group get togethers with men all over the nation and um, offer them opportunities to do hard things together and also opportunities for resources to learn how to be better fathers, better husbands, better, better employees and better employers. And what that means is it means bringing them together and putting them in front of people who who have those skills and offer those skills. So we kind of bring a community together, enjoy some really hard stuff together, do man stuff, get it, get that out of our system. Cause that's an incredible growth opportunity. And so that's the vision. Now, when that happens, I don't know, but it's the vision. It will happen. And, um, and so we just have this podcast where we just talk about the things that we, we love and believe. And having the group together and go through that experiential kind of thing. I'm, I'm such a student of masculine rites of passage. Yep. And it's something that I've talked about on previous podcasts, but there, there was a time in, in, you know, in history and in, in society and different tribal natures or, or tribal senses where there was a, um, a sense of a rite of passage for a young man to become a man. And it was that they would, you know, the, the tribal men would take the boys out into the wilderness and they would, you know, hunt a lion and chant and come back with blood on their face and a pelt and they were men yeah. Same in the tribal way, but in society. And, you know, maybe it was as, as men went to war and they were drafted and there was that part of it as well. We don't have that as much in society anymore. So we have this, this group of young, soft men that have not gone through any rite of passage that are living in this extended state of adolescence. It's like Peter Pan syndrome where yeah. you mentioned, you know, that there's so many people that are not willing to do the work or to, you know, to put it, they want to kind of stay at home and collect unemployment and play video games and, you know, and masturbate. That's what, like, how great would that be? Because they never went through a rite of passage. So I know we don't have much time left, but what are your thoughts around what, you have two sons that are teenagers, you mentioned. I have a son who's 16 years old. What are the rites of passage that young men need now to become strong men moving forward? You know, it's a, it's a really good question. This, um, when my son was a freshman, he got into a program called um, Man Up. And it was a weekly thing. And they invited dads to come along, which I think was brilliant. And they would tear a car, you know, take a, take a tire off a car, learn how to plug, change. They would, we learned how to shoot guns. We learned how, I already knew it, but they got to shoot guns. They got to play with all sorts of firearms and play in a, in a controlled 
area, but um, got to learn about man things. And they just talked about man things, finances, um, responsibilities, how to date, how to shake a man's hand, look in his eye, all these things that we aren't teaching. So it gave me this like thing because I used to drive my boys. I lived in Oregon. I'd drive them up to the, uh, the Cascade Range place. We call it Callahan's. It's only like 20 minutes from my home. We'd be out on a huge mountain overlooking these valleys and we would shoot guns, throw sticks, roll huge rocks down a mountain, destroying things. That's what, for me, that was my rite of passion. I did that with my dad and I'd go hunting with him. For my boys, it was learning how to shoot, destroying things tapping into some of those masculine energies and understanding that you have as a male, you have a lot of power and, and your, your, um, your body can produce your physicality can produce really cool things. And so for me, it was about tapping into doing hard things for them, you know, learning gun, shoot a gun. You have to be controlled. You have to be disciplined. It's hard. Um, and, and so it's really pushing, putting them in hard places and pushing. It's like the hunt, you know, you go out and you, you got to go get a kill and it's not, it's gruesome and it's uncomfortable and you're, you're seeing guts flailing out about and something dying slowly. Do we really want that? Well, it doesn't matter. The, the, what matters is that life, we're, we're indoctrinating them into the idea that life is not easy. And so those are rites of passages. Currently, people aren't doing that. Kids are shooting people on TV in a, in a game. Um, they're, I, you nailed it. Stay at home, you know, do the thing, masturbate, play games, and your life is great. You've got, you've got entertainment, adro- dopamine, and, you yep. know, testosterone in artificial sense. And I believe the rites of passage belong out in the wilderness or, or in, a, in a difficult situation. And just and I, that resonated with me. Uh, I feel like some of my rites of passage came along with doing something physical with my father, be it just just blue collar hard labor. But yeah. then there was also this connection with a community of men. I remember him taking me to a, a Monday night football game, Giants versus the 49ers in 1991. I was in I just was a freshman in high school and uh, there was a group of men s- standing around having a beer or two telling stories about their experiences, but I was accepted into that group at that time and I remember I could recall the way that I felt at that moment that I was kind of indoctrinated into this tribal sense of men but there was also this physical part as well that just it it kind of everything worked in that in that way together so to your point i i'm just really interested in how people think what we're missing right now because there's we're missing something as men in society and what can we do to help the future generations yeah i mean my kids you know my kids have tough stuff happen to them all the time and even me with my beliefs i want to jump in and save them and it is really hard to just step back and be like, they're going to be okay. When they come to me, I'll guide them. I'm going to give them suggestions, but they're going to tackle it on their own. It sucks. It's hard. But when we become soft, we develop even more soft. We're just, you know, as Angelo said, flaccid. It's just, we're just, yes. and, and look, look, those, I, I ask for challenges to come to my boys. Because I know that we're, they're in situations where the only challenges are, you know, someone doesn't like them or they say something rude. They're just stupid middle school things. I want them to be physically challenged. I want them to be um, emotionally and mentally challenged because I, because I know that that's going to grow resistance and grow um, fortitude and, and make them men who then can pass that along to their kids. And again, it's all, it's refocusing the mindset of I'm raising a kid to I'm raising a future adult. Like if you really embrace that, that's when you step up and you're like, okay, how would I want them to handle this as an adult? Are they going to have this kind of support? Is someone going to swoop in and save them? No, no, and no. And it's true. And so often, and you know, as an educator, especially dealing with, you know, it could be people in an affluent area where the, you know, the the go-to is parents would come in and argue a point and the administration would, you know, bow down because the parents were the ones that they needed to make happy pretty much. So the kids didn't learn that resiliency. And I believe strongly in rites of passage come along with dissonance. It could be cognitive dissonance. It could be physical dissonance, emotional, spiritual, whatever it is, where you have to challenge it, has to shake it up in there, and you have to figure out how you believe and how you're going to, you know, rise and, and be resilient in the future. So, 
I um I believe in everything that you're doing, Scott. I, I love your journey. And the funny thing is when when COVID happened and I was trying to reinvent myself, one of the programs, I just wrote a 12-week course. I just said, you know what, I maybe do an online course. I call it the Brotherhood of Fathers. I was like, <laughs> I would love to be awesome. able to talk to and I did like a week of you know, a video a week. Like I created this in my mind. So once I saw you were doing this, I was like, I, it has to be. I need to. I need to talk to this man That's in some awesome. way, shape, or form. I had no idea that you had already started this group. So, um, I'm along for the journey. If you put the S word out there and somebody doesn't like it, I commented back. Good shit, Scott. Way to go there. <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, another thought to any other men kind of thinking the same thing. Where I've seen real growth is, you know, um, we've got the out the hippie guys doing their thing their messages around masculinity and kind of owning up to who you are and, and getting, getting through all the stuff that you need to get through to really seek your full potential. Um, I'm, and then there's you and there's multiple guys as soon. I think some people are like, well, why are you talking with them? They have kind of the same goal. I'm like, exactly. Yes. Like we got to get rid of this mindset of, um, fear of loss is, you know, or, or someone else is going to steal our idea. We need to have a mindset of abundance. There's millions and millions of men out there that have to hear. So the more of us there are who can band together and really kind of come together with a common theme. And then, and then, Hey, if you know, we got a coach that's coaching something, or we've got a, we've got a course like you, you know, brother, brotherhood of fathers or whatever it is. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to stand on the mountaintop and say, you guys dig into this because you need it. And so it's really cool when other guys doing very similar things, reach out. I'm like open arms. Yes. Let's chat. Let's, let's use each other to share our words. I really love the opportunity. Absolutely. And what we're doing is, is collectively creating an idea around authentic, positive masculinity. It doesn't have to be, you know, toxic in any way, shape or form. We're there to empower each other. So Scott, I am here. I'm, I'm along on your journey as well. I love what you're doing. How could people that are listening today uh, find you? How could they reach out to you? So super easy, Brotherhood of Fatherhood on Facebook. We have a group. If you find the page, it's just kind of like just stuff. You can find the group. Um, you can email me or message me through Facebook. And my email is Scott at Brotherhood Fatherhood because of was taken. <laughs> um, but uh, and then we're on Instagram and everywhere else. So yeah, and if somebody's got a story to tell, I want to I want to hear them too. So I'd love for people to reach out. Absolutely. Scott, thanks so much. Truly appreciate it. Um, you. Look, I'll, I'll have you on in a couple months as well. We'll see where we are in this journey. Got a lot more to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely. Just service, my man. All right. And, uh, all right. Well, thank you very much for being here and we will see you next time on Building Men.